Thank you very much for uh, the invitation. Uh, Dr. Cameron and I go way back. Um, if I'm doing this today, it's actually because of him, so I'm going to blame everything on him. Um, Bob and I met when he was a fresh faculty and I was a fresh faculty at UCSF. We met on the wards and, and realized that nobody at UCSF was remotely interested in thoracic malignancy. So two decades later, for good or for worse, here we are. Uh, so I'm going to touch a little bit upon some of the immunotherapy uh, approaches and I'm going to finish talking about the CRS-207 vaccine trial because we've been very involved in that uh, at UCSF and have treated quite a few of those patients. So uh, it's a very interesting story that uh, is uh, just starting to uh, unfold as we speak. So real quickly, mesothelioma, though uh, low in incidence for all of us who live in port towns and in uh, towns where there had been quite a bit of asbestos-related activity, it is a major, major problem because while those activities may have ceased and may have ceased uh, a couple of decades ago, their, uh, their damages persist uh, way beyond uh, the disappearance of these industries. Um, and the prognosis for this disease is, is still abysmally poor with a median survival about 12 months and uh, a five-year survival uh, that is uh, well below 5%. So clearly there's a lot of work to be done. Uh, Dr. Olewski uh, showed you this trial already, the granddaddy of them all. This was the trial that, that really um, led to the uh, approval of Pemetrexid and uh, uh, as a standard of care for mesothelioma, clearly the backbone of Pemetrexid cisplatin really is, uh, is, is here. Uh, at least it's the best game in town and it uh, takes upon us to, to try to build on it. Um, this trial had a slight separation in curves. There was about a three month median survival. But, but what was actually very interesting is that not only was there a survival benefit, but there actually was a quality of life benefit uh, that was noticeable in terms of pain management, but also in terms of breathing. And there was some physiologic uh, measurements done to go with this, including increases in FVC, uh, forced viral capacity for these patients that was actually uh, of significant uh, um, improvement and really assisted in, in why some of these patients did a little bit better than, than what we would have expected. Um, since 2003, a lot has been going on, but a lot of disappointments as well. So mesothelioma biology, uh, we know that mesothelioma has, uh, does induce a, a really high level of VEGF expression, vascular endothelial growth factor. Uh, in fact, when you look at different uh, tumor types, uh, patients with VEGF have the highest circulating levels of VEGF. So the, I mean, p uh, patients with mesothelioma have the highest levels of circulating VEGF, which is really uh, uh, makes it seem like it should be an important factor. When you look at the uh, resected specimens, uh, mesothelioma specimens have very large numbers of microvessels, so that angiogenesis really is an important uh, phenomenon for this tumor. So. Uh, the last decade and a half has seen a lot of activity looking, trying to test all of the molecules that would target v the VEGF axis. Uh, and you can see from this list, which is really a partial list, that none of these have made a major impact. And it looks like the oral tyrosine kinase inhibitors targeting VEGF uh, may not work as well. The exception to this uh, may be Nintendmib, which is undergoing uh, uh, much further uh, evaluation than any of these molecules because the phase two trial was so uh, provocative. When you look also at uh, resected uh, mesothelioma specimens, they tend to stain very intensely by immunohistochemistry for EGFR. When you actually tease that out a little bit further, you don't quite see the same story that you'd see in lung cancer where you can actually have uh, driver mutations uh, that explain the sensitivity of lung cancer to uh, targeted therapies. Mesothelioma, you never see uh, targeted uh, mutations so that uh, you do activating mutations so that you, not, you see no activity when you try to target uh, 
the VEGF axis. The PDGF axis also would seem to be a very good target for mesothelioma. There's a lot of PDGF uh, overexpression and, and uh, preferentially the, the, the beta uh, part of the gene is more expressed than the alpha, which is more expressed in normal tissues. And yet, targeting it with drugs like imatinib or vitalinib uh, doesn't seem to have as good an effect as you would have expected. So none of these agents really has made it into prime time. So despite this, is there any progress? Uh, Dr. Olewski uh, presented uh, the results of the MAPS trial. And the MAPS trial is uh, some progress. There had been uh, an earlier attempt by uh, Dr. Kindler uh, et al. Uh, to test the addition of bevacizumab to chemotherapy, but this was uh, the trial uh, was pre-pemetrexid uh, days, and it was a gemcitabine-based uh, chemotherapy backbone, which is probably not as effective. So Dr. Kindler's trial uh, ended up being negative. It was a smaller trial. It was, it was a consortium trial, so it wasn't just a single institution study, but it, it still ended up being a negative study. Nonetheless, it had a provocative result uh, that in an uh, unplanned analysis, if you looked at the circulating level of VEGF and, and uh, were able to devise a cut point between high and low, patients who had low expression of VEGF were the ones who seemed to be responding to bevacizumab whereas the very high level of VEGF patients did not seem to respond to, to the addition of bevacizumab. That result has not been tested prospectively. Meanwhile, this trial came along with a better uh, chemotherapy backbone to, uh, to base uh, the use of bevacizumab on, and indeed it was positive with uh, an improvement in median survival of about two, two months or so. Um, Dr. Uh, Sturman made a point earlier about uh, whether this, this trial really was applicable and should, be, should serve as the, as the control arm, uh, at least the, the active arm in this, arm in this trial, should serve as the, the control for future studies. And, and that certainly is something that is being considered in, in a number of uh, trials. The problem uh, has to do with uh, the use of bevacizumab in elderly patients. It's very difficult in people over 70 to receive this drug. Uh, cardiovascular morbidity, uh, cerebrovascular morbidity uh, are, uh, are clearly a problem. Interestingly enough, with this amount of bulky mediastinal disease, uh, there were very few hemorrhagic uh, issues seen in this trial, whereas in lung cancer, uh, the minute there's mediastinal involvement or uh, contiguity to large vessels, there is uh, a, a, a significant risk for uh, hemorrhagic uh, morbidity uh, and mortality. Not seen in this trial, though. Uh, so indeed, the, the control arm in this, in, in this study had a much better result than what we're used to seeing. If you remember, the Vogelzank study had a control arm uh, with uh, platinum alone of about nine months in this study, and, and, the, uh, and the treatment arm with uh, uh, pemetrexid and cisplatinum had a survival of about 12 months. Here, the control arm with just platinum and uh, pemetrexid had a survival of nearly 16 months. Now, we're not quite sure why that is. Is it that we're now caring for these patients better than we were uh, 13 years ago? Is it that perhaps the population here was a lot younger than the population in the Vogelzang trial? The median age in Vogelzang was around, was over 70. The median age in this trial was about 65. So clearly there are, this, this is a, an important trial. It, uh, it does uh, make uh, bevacizumab an agent to be uh, considered, but it doesn't, in my mind, establish it uh, absolutely as a, uh, as a panacea for all, uh, for all patients. So a dozen years later, we uh, have not really gone that far beyond uh, the backbone. Uh, the response rates are still around 25%. Uh, the median survival is still around 12 months to 18 months uh, if you have a, a, a particularly more active uh, companion. The five-year survival is still well below 5%. And again, bevacizumab is not applicable to the whole mesothelioma world, all right? That's, that's a very important point to, to be made. Uh, so 
what's even more daunting is that we still don't have a decent second line approach for patients once they progress through uh, the penetrexid platinum uh, backbone. So what's next? So we're entering an age of, uh, a golden age of immunotherapy. There's been, uh, through the FDA approval of, of a number of molecules uh, in uh, diseases like uh, melanoma and uh, non-small cell lung cancer and now in bladder cancer, we actually have quite a lot of molecules uh, to play with. And there really have been some new understanding of uh, the tumor identity and the way the tumor sort of shields itself from the, uh, from the host immune system. Um, all of this leads to uh, exciting new possibilities. So very briefly, uh, I'm gonna recapitulate uh, the efforts of titans in uh, the field of uh, tumor immunobiology uh, in a fairly simplistic cartoon, but I think it, it does illustrate a little bit what we're trying to uh, talk about and target. So you have a tumor uh, that's there, and this tumor has a life cycle, just like uh, normal cells as well, and a number of these cells are gonna die, whether they die of their own volition uh, through senescence or whatever, or they die through uh, other uh, body factors. The result, the result is that you're gonna be releasing uh, cancer cell antigens. These antigens are gonna be uh, taken up by dendritic cells, uh, and processed inside these dendritic cells to uh, turn these dendritic cells into antigen-presenting cells. These cells are gonna translate to the uh, uh, to uh, lymph nodes where they're gonna expose a whole population of T cells to the antigens that they are, uh, that they've learned to uh, identify from, uh, from the tumor. Once in that compartment, T cells are exposed and, and sort of learn how to recognize these antigens. And, and when I explain this to patients, I usually tell them it's, it's akin to giving a dog a scent and sending it on a, on a hunting job. Uh, these T cells are then gonna translate and, and traffic to the tumor through a uh, circulatory system, usually blood vessels, but also they can do so uh, through uh, uh, lymphatic. And once they get to uh, the site, they have to exfiltrate these structures and get into the tumor itself where they can uh, hopefully uh, exert uh, their activity and uh, end up uh, killing cancer cells. Obviously, this is a process that has um, uh, quite a lot of uh, checkpoints and, and regulatory mechanisms. Uh, as you can see, in green are, are uh, a number of stimulatory factors in red, a number of stimulatory factors. There are several areas that we're particularly interested. CTLA-4 is, a, is a, an area that is particularly interesting at the level of the lymph node and it, it, it is basically active in the expansion of that T cell population that now has an idea of what, uh, what to look for. And then um, the PD-1, PD-L1 axis is more, is more a tumor site uh, issue uh, where the, the activated lymphocytes can be turned off uh, through an interaction with uh, molecules that target these receptors uh, and explains a little bit why uh, it is important to look for the presence of PDL1 in tumors to see whether they could potentially be uh, targetable with some of the new agents that go in that direction. Um, <coughs> Rafael Bueno published a very interesting article in Nature this year, uh, basically looking at the uh, expression of mutations in a number of tumor cell types. And uh, clearly in the yellow box, you can see mesothelioma is at an end of that spectrum that is less immunogenic. This is very important because in general, uh, the more immunogenic a tumor is, the more likely it is to respond to some of these agents uh, that target the immune system. And in particular, uh, you have here uh, a number of uh, lung cancer uh, variations and head and neck cancers, which are, uh, if you will, um, environmentally caused uh, cancers to a certain extent through the use of tobacco. Uh, there's an, uh, a great deal of mutagenesis that, ha that happens from the, uh, the 500 plus or more carcinogens in tobacco smoke that actually make these tumors a lot more visible to the immune system. Uh, even in lung cancer, when you have patients who, who have 
lung cancer uh, who are never smokers, their response to these uh, interventions is much less robust, if you will, than those uh, patients who have actually uh, developed lung cancer through, uh, through smoking. Mesothelioma is an environmentally caused cancer with asbestos, but the mutagenicity of asbestos is much more complicated and doesn't yield the same amount of, of mutations, if you will, than the other uh, very complex biochemical uh, mutagens. Um, when you look at the PDL uh, one expression with mesothelioma, uh, looking at a number of different uh, retrospective analyses, suffice it to say that there is PDL one expression in mesothelioma, and, and more interesting, uh, there is a greater PDL one expression in sarcomatoid mesothelioma, which is uh, is going to be uh, uh, interesting for future uh, therapeutic interventions. And PDL one expression correlates very well with a poor outcome. The more uh, PDL1 expression you have, green line here, the, the, the worse the outcome is for, uh, for patients. So here are some initial efforts at targeting uh, the PD1, PDL1 axis, and I believe Dr. Stillman is going to cover that as well uh, in more detail. This was a trial from, uh, that was presented by uh, one of his colleagues, Dr. Ali. Uh, Evan Ali uh, from uh, University of Pennsylvania. This was Keynote 28, which was a basket trial. This is a trial design that's actually very interesting. Uh, you end up accruing uh, patients in very diff with very different indications in, in, in sort of unique groups. And uh, Keynote 28 had, was one of the first trials to have a pure mesothelioma group, uh, which is where those uh, patients were treated. We actually participated in this study. Uh, and saw some very interesting activities. So the patients had their usual uh, mesothelioma uh, presentation. Uh, they needed to have a good performance status. Uh, they needed to have measurable disease. And for this particular study, they needed to have sent in tissue to assess uh, for the presence of PDL1. It did not require heavy uh, presence, it just re required PDL1 positivity. So this is what you look for on the tumor cells. And these patients were treated with a, a pretty hefty dose of pembrolizumab. Now we're using a little bit less than that. Uh, and those patients who uh, had a response continued to treat for up to 24 months uh, or until progression or intolerable, the, the development of intolerable toxicity. Those who uh, had confirmed progression stopped. And classic mesothelioma population, Median age, uh, a little younger perhaps than, than what we used to see, but around 65. Uh, overwhelmingly male, overwhelmingly uh, Caucasian, excellent performance status, overwhelmingly epithelioid with few sarcomatoid and biphasic. Uh, and this was a pretty heavily pretreated. All, uh, all of them had had some kind of cytotoxic therapy prior to, to starting. Uh, this is the... Uh, response assessment using uh, modified resist, which is a technique that is especially designed for mesothelioma assessment. When you use conventional radiologic techniques, it's a lot harder to figure things out, but this modified resist allows, it, uh, allows meso mesothelioma clinical trials to speak the same language. Anyway, using this technique, uh, about 60% of the patients were on this side of the waterfall plot. Uh, in a waterfall plot, you want to see decline, which is why these are negative percentages. You want to see the tumor uh, get into uh, negative percentage points, and the, 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 the more people on this side of, the, of, of this black line, the better off you are. Uh, here in this uh, is called a swimmer's lane plot. It really looks at the duration of the response, and obviously the longer the line, the better the duration. But this is a very healthy swimmer's plot for uh, a first attempt at uh, immunotherapy. And median survival curve, as you can see, median survival was about, uh, median disease-free survival was about six months. Uh, not perfect, but certainly uh, a very good signal. What was actually very surprising in this study that was that the PDL1 expression was absolutely not associated with the response. People with low expression responded, people with high expression responded. There didn't seem to be a clear-cut relationship. Now, this may be because this was a small trial, 
but this is a signal that warrants quite a lot more uh, interest. This is a patient who uh, has pure sarcomatoid mesothelioma. This is one of my patients with a fairly large tumor over here between these arrows. And after uh, three or four infusions of pembrolizumab, uh, this area is not there. And I believe this big conglomerate may be reduced to just this. Uh, about a year and a half later, this gentleman is still receiving pembrolizumab and is doing actually quite well. He's, uh, he really has no symptoms attributable to the meso. His only problem is that he's developed uh, toxicity from the pembrolizumab and had to go on a fairly long uh, break for about two or three months uh, due to the development of very sig significant skin toxicity. So it's very interesting uh, manifestation. He has to wear a lot of gloves now because uh, his hands are very scaly from the pembrolizumab. Um, looking at uh, other uh, continuing efforts in there, uh, these are the three studies so far. Uh, this is actually uh, a second study that was done with nivolumab, which is a very uh, similar molecule to pembrolizumab. Uh, pembrolizumab is made by Merck. Nivolumab is made by Bristol-Myers, so competing uh, molecules. Uh, this was a European study that is still ongoing. Again, you're seeing similar uh, partial response, uh, similar con disease control rate, um, uh, so um, very. these are probably not going to be very different over time. Um, here is a different molecule. Both pembrolizumab and nivolumab target the PD-1 receptor, which is located on the surface of the T cells. This molecule, avelumab, targets the PD-L1 receptor, which is more likely to be located on the surface of the uh, tumor cells. So... Uh <coughs> And uh, obviously, it's going to have the same, uh, a similar t uh, effect. It's just targeting the other side of the bridge, so to speak, and trying to hit the, uh, the receptor that way. Um, what may be different is that because you're targeting the tumor itself, you may be developing an uh, antibody-dependent uh, cytotoxic effect. Uh, once you hit a receptor on a cell, and uh, it can trigger uh, other responses from the immune system, which, which can kill the cell just because you, uh, you bind an antibody. So this is maybe an effect that is actually important uh, for the future. And this molecule, uh, Avelumab, has had some activity uh, demonstrated in lung cancer and a number of other, uh, other carcinomas. So the design was very similar. This was also a basket trial. It had a little bit uh, more patients, 53 but similar uh, eligibility criteria. The dosing was uh, what had been determined from uh, expanded studies, uh, expanded access, not, not expanded access, uh, expansion phases of phase one studies, um, using, uh, looking at, at response, safety, uh, progression-free survival, and uh, the expression of the PDL1 marker in the, in the tumor tissue. And over here, uh, the results were a little bit less encouraging than they were, but still uh, a positive waterfall plot, nonetheless, which I'll show you in a minute. Uh, there were five clear partial response here. Their swimmer's plot uh, measured in weeks. And over here, you'll see the waterfall plot. There's obviously a lot more, a lot more patients on the, on the not so good side of the waterfall plot but some very deep responses here uh, on this side of the waterfall plot. And this is something we call a spider plot, which gives you an idea of the time to the response and how long the response uh, lasts. Below this line is actually what we define as a radiographic response. Uh, under this line is what we consider stable disease in the middle. So you can see that there's a lot of, lot of green and even some green turning into orange fairly late in the game. So. Uh, these patients are deriving clearly a benefit, even though radiographically they're not necessarily going down, they are deriving a significant benefit. Uh, these slides, by the way, were the slides that Rafid Hassan presented at, uh, at ASPE. Uh, here, too, uh, the progression-free survival did not seem to depend on PDL1 expression, which was, again, a little bit surprising uh, and is something that warrants further uh, investigation in the future. Uh, so when you put all three studies together in one table, you can see that the effect, there is clearly an effect, but 
we're, we're just not quite there yet. Uh, a minority of patients are responding rather than a majority, even though on paper we should see a lot more, uh, a lot more activity. Uh, looking at a different target, so we've targeted uh, with the PDL1 uh, axis approach, we're targeting things that are happening in the tumor and that are maybe that may be driven directly by the tumor. Uh, by targeting CTLA4, we're targeting things that are happening perhaps a little bit away from the tumor. They may still be influenced by the tumor, but they're happening uh, more in the lymph uh, uh, lymphocyte uh, uh, lymph node uh, reservoir rather than the actual tumor site itself. Tremolimumab is an anti-CTLA-4 molecule, very similar to ipilimumab, which was approved for mesothelioma uh, some four or five years ago. It was, in fact, the first immune targeting therapy uh, approved for, for a cancer indication in a really, really long time. Um, <coughs> Tremolimumab is made by a different company than ipilimumab. Uh, and in a couple of uh, small phase one studies done uh, um, in Italy in particular, uh, we saw that you could get some very nice uh, overall survival in patients who had been heavily pretreated before. Uh, almost 50% survived a year when this is a population that doesn't really have a second line option. It's nice to see that you can prolong survival uh, with this approach. So these two trials really suggested that it would be worth testing this in larger, on a larger scale trial in a randomized fashion. And this is the determined study that Dr. Kindler presented at ASCO, uh, a very large study, 571 patients. What was dramatic about this study was how quickly it accrued. Normally, a, a 571 uh, patient uh, study in lung cancer would take probably three to five years to accrue. This study in mesothelioma, which is a, a, a hundred times less common than, uh, than lung cancer, this study accrued in 18 months, which was really uh, fantastic. Um, it was a double-blind uh, study. It was a two-to-one randomization. It was double-blind, but uh, because of the side effect profile of the drug, you knew very quickly if your patient was actually getting active drug. Uh, it does cause some, uh, some side, side effects. Uh, this study was open to, to peritoneal disease uh, as well. And patients were randomized to getting tremolimumab uh, every uh, four weeks for seven doses, then a maintenance of every, uh, every 12 weeks, or placebo IV. And the primary endpoint was overall survival, so it wasn't progression-free survival, which sometimes the FDA frowns upon. Unfortu and here's the, the patient population, very similar to what we've been talking about again, uh, mid to late 60s, uh, mostly epithelioid, uh, advanced stage for the most part, uh, at least in second line, by definition, these patients had had to have seen some chemotherapy before. Uh, some of them had had more than one regime. And then uh, virtually everybody had seen prior penetrexid. And everybody had a decent performance status. This survival curve, as you can see, has really no significant splay in it. And the hazard ratio of 0.92 was really not statistically significant. Uh, again, this was a little bit disappointing, uh, but it may have to do with CTLA-4 not being quite as good a, uh, a target by itself as, uh, as PD-1. Um, so in second, third line, this was not effective. Uh, the safety data that we saw, the safety signals in this study were consistent with what we would have expected with tremolimumab. We didn't see anything more than uh, what we would have expected. but. Uh, what was really remarkable is that if you have an exciting uh, concept and an exciting study, uh, you can accrue to it very, very fast, even in an, in an orphan disease like mesothelioma that has uh, uh, not as many patients to, to draw upon. So how are perhaps uh, tumors defeating uh, some of our efforts? Well, one of the problems may have to do with gen the generation of insufficient number of T cells, and this is a problem at this level in this compartment. Another possibility is that even though you generate some cells, not enough of them make it to where, they are, where they're needed. And finally, once they get there, and this is the whole PD-1, PD-L1 story, uh, the T cells are inhibited in inside the tumor in, uh, microenvironment. Not only can the tumor do that, but there's a number of cells that are, that are modified by the tumor that can actually uh, lead to some in, uh, 
uh, inhibitory signals. And you can see that at this, at this level, the list of stimulants is, is much less than the list of uh, inhibitors. So since we've identified a number of these possibilities, there is a tremendous amount of work ongoing to try to optimize what we're doing uh, with these molecules. And what I've shown you are very crude, very early efforts to try to get at these, uh, at these questions. Another possibility is to target um, uh, this mesothelian uh, receptor, which is preferentially expressed on mesothelioma cells. Uh, Dr. Levsky talked to you a lot about uh, mesothelian di direct directed uh, monoclonal antibody efforts. Uh, over here, uh, I'm going to talk to you about this mesothelian vaccine with uh, CRS207, which is a uh, modified listeria. It's modified in the removal of two genes, which uh, account for some of the nastiness that Listeria does to, to people. Listeria was a, was a very important uh, pathogen at the turn of the century. In fact, Listerine was kind of developed to try to fight Listeriosis. And every once in a while, it raises its ugly head in, in food preparation. There was a, list, uh, a Listeria outbreak not that long ago in commercial uh, salad uh, preparation and a few years before that in, uh, in Jalisco cheese. And when people uh, consume these tainted products, they can actually get pretty sick. And part of that is because Listeria will invade, and this is actually a very nice little representation of what Listeria does, it invades the cells and then it invades other cells. The red Listeria here are the, the wild type Listeria, whereas the blue ones are the CRS207 modified Listeria. So you can see that the red ones are kind of going all over the place and even trying to get inside an, uh, an adjacent cell, whereas the blue ones are actually staying very, very put. This is an actual uh, micrograph from, uh, from the company that uh, produces this vaccine. The design of the study was fairly straightforward. Uh, patients, once they uh, met eligibility criteria uh, and started treatment, received two doses of Listeria administered intravenously two weeks apart. And these patients uh, come into the infusion center, they get, they get their Listeria infusion. They usually get very significant rigors. They, they shake quite a bit. And uh, usually these rigors are well mitigated by uh, giving a little bit of Demerol. Uh, mostly they have an unpleasant day with fatigue, uh, some nausea, and, and those rigors. But usually by the third day, which is when we see them, they're actually doing quite well. Once they do their first two vaccinations, they go on to receive six cycles, up to six cycles of uh, pemetrexid cisplatinum with CT evaluations every other cycle to make sure that people are still responding to treatment. Once they make it to uh, the sixth cycle, then they receive another two boosts of vaccine. And if uh, they still haven't uh, progressed by then, they go on to receive maintenance dose of vaccine every eight weeks. So we see them back uh, and, and we scan them every eight weeks to ensure uh, that they're continuing to respond. Now the protocol uh, uh, was modified with the addition of one dose of cyclophosphamide at low dose, at 200 milligrams per meter square, which is not a very big dose of cyclophosphamide, administered one day before each of these vaccines here, 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 and uh, with the boost. The purpose of this uh, pre-dosing with cyclophosphamide is to try to perhaps um, neutralize the T regulatory cell compartment. These are T cells that actually blunt the effect of the immune response and trying to see if we can get them out of it. So that cohort of patients is still ongoing. It, it's met all of its accruals, but uh, quite a few patients are still being treated, which is very exciting. So again, this population was a little bit older than what we saw um, in uh, the, trials, the other trials that I showed you with 71, uh, which means that we treated people as old as 82. Uh, and again, mostly males, mostly Caucasians, good performance status. Um, uh, one patient snuck in here with a with uh, peritoneal, this is really a strictly plural mesothelioma study. Um, and then the majority of these patients uh, have uh, epithelial, a few have biphasic, but by 
there's a requirement in the study that if they have biphasing component, they should have less than 50 percent um, uh, sarcomatoid because sarcomatoid mesothelioma does not really express mesothelin very well. So there's actually some, some uh, justification behind that exclusion. Uh, here are some of the adverse events. This was extremely well tolerated. M all, most of these uh, events, the grade three events, really have to do with the fever being going high and the chills and rigors uh, being a little bit more uh, debilitating at the time of, of uh, administration. Once the patient comes back to clinic, uh, either 24 hours or, or 48 hours after the administration, there really isn't any more symptomatology to, to speak of. So very, very well tolerated. And most importantly, no infectious complications. We didn't see any patients have uh, persistent listeriosis. In the whole CRS-207 program, which included a whole, uh, a very large uh, effort in pancreatic cancer, there's only been one documented uh, episode of continuing uh, listeria presence in the body uh, uh, several days after the infusion. And this is in a patient who received the listeria against protocol recommendations through a chest port. So the chest port got colonized and allowed for seeding of the stream. When you give the listeria peripherally, there's absolutely no problems with uh, contamination and colonization. Even if the patient still has a port, they, st they don't get contaminated uh, from the peripheral administration. This is the kind of waterfall plot you want to see. Very little going up and most everything going down. So this uh, had a 60% response rate, stable disease 35% for a disease control rate of 94%. This is good stuff. We like that a lot. And this is really uh, not what you expect to see from pemetrexid alone. Uh, this is the, the spider graph. You can see that there's very few dots above the, the, the stabilization line and quite a few lots below the, uh, the response line. This is really also the kind of spider plot you want to see. Um, and here are some very long uh, responses. Uh, in all of the other uh, swimmers plots that I've shown you, this axis was weeks. Here we're talking about months. So the duration is actually, the response is actually a very durable and very effective response. So this was a well-tolerated uh, agent. It worked very well with chemotherapy. It achieved a uh, more than 90% disease control uh, rate. The results are being confirmed in the uh, second cohort that we're de de doing with um, uh, the cyclophosphamide pretreatment. Future duration, uh, there is a phase gl three global trial that's been planned. And interestingly, to answer your question, that trial actually allowed the use of bevacizumab in control and uh, just asked uh, sites to sort of de uh, uh, to declare whether that patient was going to get it and stick to it. So you couldn't just like in the middle of it add bevacizumab if you felt like it. Um, and um, the trial is on hold uh, due to the negative results in pancreatic cancer, which is a n very poor immunogenic cancer. So the company is not a huge company and they're a little bit, uh, they're, they're they sobered up a little bit after the, uh, the results from the pancreas study. So things are, are being discussed what to, what to do next. But one clear uh, direction that is going to be explored is combining CRS-207 uh, with uh, PD-1, PDL one axis drugs. And that's actually a study that I'm very uh, much looking for. That's going to be a very exciting uh, possibility. Uh, so clearly, PDL one is very much expressed in mesothelioma, but most patients don't respond uh, to this. And we don't really, at this point, have good predictors on how to raise uh, the response from chemotherapy as high as we can get it. Uh, chemotherapy itself can change the visibility of the tumor by uh, causing the presentation of neo, of what's called neo uh, epitopes and new antigens. It may be that combining chemotherapy with these agents uh, is going to be one of the, the possibilities. So there's a number of studies that are being planned. Here's one that combines uh, the PEMSYS backbone with one of the anti pdl one antibodies. Uh, here, uh, combining uh, uh, an anti pd one with an anti-CTLA-4 also does make sense. Uh, and that's actually a big study that uh, we're, we're participating in. It's going to be opened in a, just a few weeks. 
here's another CTLA-4 uh, PD-1 study, and then a number of different, uh, different options. So immunotherapy approaches can be effective in mesothelioma. At this point, we're at the, really at the early discovery stage and look to see a lot of efforts uh, in that arena uh, in the next few years. It's gonna really uh, drive uh, the next uh, decade of research in, in mesothelioma. We really need to identify relevant biomarkers so that we can enhance not only the effectiveness of the approach, but, but really select people who are most likely to benefit from this. And then uh, obviously we, we need to keep moving forward and, and uh, 